look around what's happening in our world. My heart longs. Lord, when are you coming? We're living in a better time, and I know you know what's going on in our world. It's filled with troubles and temptations. But there is good news. His strength, Jesus Christ's strength, is perfect. Let us bow our heads as we open this worship service with prayer. Father in heaven, we would like to hide behind the cross this week. Like to personally hide in your grace and your mercies. I'm glad I'm not consumed your gracious, long-suffering spirit abounds. Where sin abounds, your grace abounds more and more. Oh Lord, once again I ask you to use my unclean, sinful lips that your people may hear your word tonight as we gather to pray. We're living in a dangerous, troubled, sick, crime-infested world. And the good news that we are holding on is the hope that one day you will right the wrong when you will come. Oh Lord Jesus, I would like to pray that all of us here tonight, our hearts are touched by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the experiences that we have had for the past few nights. I thank you, Lord, that you have led your people faithfully to come. And I'd like to praise you tonight. I'd like to give this honor to your name's honor and glory. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who love Jesus. Tonight's topic is about the trials of the saints. We all know what trial means and we all know what saints mean. Saints simply just mean believers in the Lord who are forgiven, who confess their sins and surrender their lives to Jesus, and they have committed their lives to follow the Lord wherever the shepherd is going. Trial of the saints. I lost my mother when I was 16. I lost my father when I was 21. But God the Father lost His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me to save us from our sins. When I started my college years, I was Filled or I was experiencing a lot of trials, troubles in my life. For you who don't know me, probably you will say, think that I am, you know, very confident or very uh, sure of myself, but I will tell you it's the opposite. I quit not only ten times when I was taking my Bachelor of Theology, I quit. One reason is lack of financial support. Another reason is there has been too, uh, so, uh, too much pressure when you are a theology student. But the Lord continues to call me. And as I look back on those trials that I had experienced, I can say, praise God, because those trials made me stronger to face many more trials in the present as well as in the future. Because you know what, friends, let me tell you, God chastens, or God tries those He loves. If you are facing so many trials tonight, that is an indication that God would like, would like to give you a lesson in life, or God would like to tell you that He cares and He loves you, 
and he wants to fashion you just like a potter who is fashioning a clay. Trial of the sins. This is a document that I would like to read from uh, one of those who waited for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. His name was Hiram Hinson. He was a farmer in New York. And he was one of those Millerite uh, believers who believed that Jesus will come on October 22, 1844, based on William Miller's interpretation of Daniel 8, verse 14. On 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. They thought that the sanctuary that will be cleansed would be the earthly sanctuary. And so they, have, they sold everything that they had. They have said goodbye to their friends. They have, some of them left their, their, their fruit crops, their potatoes, lying on the ground. They didn't bother to harvest them because they were waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. October 22, 1844 came. And all of them, some of them went to their homes, and most of them, I mean, waiting for the Lord. What we call one of the famous Ascension Mountain in Eastern United States. But we all know the story that the Lord had come October 22, 1844. And one of those who experienced the bitterest disappointment in his life, disappointments in his life, I mean, was a man, a farmer named Hiram Hinson in New York. And after a few years, he decided to, to print this uh, uh, handwritten account, which I would like to read with you this evening. It says there, Our expectations were raised high, and thus we look for our coming Lord. The day had, been, had then passed, and our disappointment had become a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of earthly friends would have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawned. Has the, the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden city, no paradise? Is all this but a cannily devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hopes and expectations? I began to feel there might be light. There might be light and help for us in distress. We continue in earnest prayer. I like, I love how Hiram Hitson wrote this when he said, We continue in earnest prayer. Friends, at times we'll be disappointed. There will be disappointments in our lives. Would you agree with me? There are disappointments in lives. But just like our pioneers or those who believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ in 1844, they did not give up. They continued, continued in earnest prayer. I like to continue my reading. Until the Spirit was given that our prayers were accepted and that light should be given, our disappointment explained, made clear and satisfactory. After breakfast, I said to one of my brethren, let us go and see the carriage some of our brethren. We started and while passing through a large field, you know, the Millerites were so ashamed they don't want to take the road because their friends and their neighbors might say, hey, I thought you're already in heaven. How come you're still here? They are afraid to be ridiculed, mocked, and uh, be an object of scorn by their neighbors and their friends, who, who they said, you know what, they will, they will be going to heaven in October 22, 44. So they took the, the large field where their people will not, see, will not see them. As I was stuck about midway of the field, heaven 
seemed open to my view. And I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to this earth on the tenth day of the seventh month at the end of 2,300 days, he, for the first time, entered on that day into the second apartment of the sanctuary. And that he had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to the earth. And my mind was directed to the 10th chapter of Revelation, where I could see the vision had spoken and did not lie. Review and Herald, June 23, 1921. Obviously, in this handwritten account by Hiram Itzen, it, is, it was implied and, 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 and vividly recalled that they were disappointed. But let me tell you, this was not the first disappointment of Christ's disciples. The first disappointment of Christ's disciples when was when Jesus was brought to Pilate. That Judas thought that Jesus who performed a lot of miracles, who had shown extraordinary, supernatural, miraculous provisions and healings, will be able to set himself free using his supernatural powers. But Judas was wrong. Instead, Jesus allowed his captors to imprison him. He allowed the will of, of the Father to, to, to be fulfilled in his life. And so Judas, one of the reasons why Judas took his own life was that he failed. He thought that after seven Jesus, Jesus could find a way to, uh, to free himself and call on the Israelites to revolt against the Roman Empire so that the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ on earth will be established. But Judas was wrong because he was thinking of the earthly kingdom not of the heavenly kingdom. His mind was on the world. That's why he took the money, 30 pieces of silver. And the disciples were disappointed, my friends. Why? Because most of them think like Judas. Because they were Palestinian, they were Jews, and they were, they were so oppressed by their conquering, uh, by the conqueror, conquerors in Rome, and they were subjugated, and they, and they would like to be set free and worship their God. And they thought that Jesus will use his power to establish his earthly king, kingdom. But they were all wrong. Jesus did not use his divine power. He allowed himself to be spit upon, to be tortured, to be mocked, derided, scorned, and eventually sentenced to die. The first disappointment was not the 1844. The first great disappointment was when the disciples who ran away in the Garden of Gethsemane and they saved their own skin. Oh, do you know that man? Peter would say, Ah, oh, I don't know him. The second time Peter was asked by uh, this hand, hand, by this lady, by this handman, I think you are one of those followers of that Jesus the Christ, they say. In fact, you were, you, you act and you talk like him. And then Peter started to curse so that he will, the lady would be convinced that he is not one of those who follow Jesus. Peter denied Jesus because their earthly ambitions were not fulfilled. That was the first part. The second great disappointment was when the disciple, when, when the people of God who studied the Bible in October 22, 1844, when they were waiting for, for the Savior to come to them, come. That was the second great disappointment in my understanding, dear beloved. And so this letter was, or this document was given to us um, by Hiram Edson. The Bible says to prophesy again. Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 10, verses 10 to 11. Then I took the little book. This is Daniel. The little book here in Revelation is Daniel because the book of Revelation um, hinges or gets its source from the prophetic book of Daniel. This little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, not literally ate it, 
but was trying to calculate and trying to understand what, what, the, what the prophecy of Revelation uh, Daniel was talking about. And it was as sweet as honey in my, in my mouth. It meaning, oh, the Lord is coming. The Messiah is being proclaimed to come. But, John the Revelator continues, when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Our Adventist pioneers interpret this line to be meaning in 1844, Jesus did not come as they were expecting. And he said to me, the angel said to John, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nation tongues, and king. We use this verse, dearly beloved, to continue the proclamation of the everlasting gospel. We who are called by God to this marvelous life, we are called to prophesy again. We are called to, to sound the midnight cries. We are called by Jesus to tell the world of the impending doom, to warn the people of the soon coming Lord. And that's why when the Lord called me, I accepted the call to be a minister. To be perfectly honest, I did not really plan to be a minister. Do you know what was wrong? My own personal preference, I wanted to be an English teacher or proceed with studying law. But the Lord has other plans for me. He called me to preach the everlasting gospel to the world. Prophesy. Friends, our pioneers were disappointed. This church was, was established because our pioneers persevered. They continued to read the Bible. They continued to earnestly pray. And they prophesied again. The lesson that we can learn here is that there are many disappointments in life. Yes, I have been disappointed many times. You know, I married late. I got married when I was 30. But nowadays, that's the norm, or that's the trend. But during my time, there were people who got married earlier. And it was so hard for me to, to find the, the so-called right person for my life. Do you know how many times I was rejected by, by those pretty, beautiful Adventist ladies? More than 10 times. I once started to connect with this lady who was a pastor's daughter, a PK, pastor's kid, and I was taking my theology in CPAC, and I, when I, she was so beautiful, she was studying medicine in, in Ilo, Ilo, one of the universities there, and when I started to, to try to win her heart, she said to me, I told her, you know, I like you, she said to me, I'm sorry, I like somebody else. <laughs> She's now a doctor. She married one more members in our church for young people. I was rejected not only once, I was rejected not only twice, I was rejected many times. But I did not give up on my profession and to find the right person for me. And that's why I said to you, my friends, you might meet disappointments. You might be meeting Trials. But the Bible is telling us never, never give up. Prophesy again. The more our sense of need drives us to Him, to Jesus, and to the Word of God, the more exalted views we shall have of His character, and the more fully we shall reflect His image, steps to Christ. Page 44. Isn't this a resounding true statement from Alan G. White? I believe this that the more we feel our need for a Savior, the, the need drives us to Jesus. One of the reasons why I hold on to my faith as a Seventh day Adventist is because I was looking for somebody to, to care for me, to love me. And to, to make me feel that I belong. You know, when I was baptized 12 years old, I told you already, it was so hard. Because when I was baptized, I could also feel the, the loud 
Holy See and the Spirit in our church. I could, when I was, during that time when I was a teenager, I, I could feel that I don't, I don't belong to this church. And so I started looking for other churches. I went to the Baptist churches. I went to the Pentecostal churches, the Assemblies of God. I went to other evangelical churches every Sunday just to find, because you know, when you're a young person, your, your mind is, is trying to ask for, ask some questions and queries, and you're becoming skeptical. And I look for other, for other churches for, 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 for me to feel that I belong. But then the Spirit tells me, as I read the Scriptures, that indeed the Seventh-day Adventist faith is the faith rooted in the Bible. Especially the Sabbath. I could not leave the church because of the Sabbath. I could have ended up somewhere else, dearly beloved. I could have ended up being converted by somebody else because I was feeling the need. I'm not saying that all the churches are like that. I'm just saying that sometimes we feel that there is no spirit that cares for us even inside the church. But the more we have exalted views of Jesus and His Word, the more fully we shall reflect this image. Friends, I like to make this statement. No cross, no crown, no trial, no trial. The harder your trial is, the glorious the trial. If you stay in faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. I took this picture in the walled city of Jerusalem, the old city, because there is that old city in Jerusalem, it's walled, the walls that have been uh, built by uh, uh, centuries of uh, uh, emperors and kings. And outside of the old Jerusalem is the new Jerusalem, outside of that, the modern where there are tall buildings, apartments, and stuff like that. I took this picture when we entered into uh, this place occupied by the Arabs. This is the Arab quarter of, uh, of the old city of Jerusalem, the city of David. And according to tradition, this is the city, uh, this, is, this picture is where, according to tradition, was Pontius Pilate's courtyard, where he pronounced, where he washed, his hands and say, you know what? Whom will you choose? What's his name? Barabbas or Jesus? And the people in the mall were, were shouting, free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. We don't want Jesus. This is the place. And I was beholding this. I was, the gospel came back to my, my mind and I, and I opened my mind so I said, I said In fact, Pontius Pilate will not want to condemn Jesus because he cannot find anything worth condemning in the man Jesus Christ. But the mob, the people, popular outcry, they shouted, crucify Jesus, free Barabbas. Isn't that what is true? Our present society. When the mob calls, the majority calls, our institutions, our our system gives in. You know what I'm talking about, right? When the mob, when the media, when the popular voice of the people, regardless of righteousness or unrighteousness, but most most of them is that they are crying out because of their they want for convenience and to be politically correct. They were just like those moms during the time of Jesus. Free Barabbas, crucify Jesus. I can hear it right now in our, in our society. Crucify the good stuff, free the bad stuff. They want to enjoy, they want to be, they want to be equal. We are living 
in a very troubled times. But the good news is today, in spite of the trials, God sent forth His Son to endure the cross for us. This is the picture that I saw. And I was walking along the corners there. If I, am, if I did not forget, there are about 14 stations which uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church had, uh, had put in place during the time of the mother of Constantine the Great, Helena, that's why they call it Saint Helena. She built these edifices or structures to honor and commemorate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was there, Via Dolorosa. I walked where Jesus walked. And every step that I take while I was there, contemplating that Jesus was carrying a cross, a wooden cross, with, with a thorn, with a crown of thorn on his head. And I, before that, I was in the church where my guy told me, our guy told me that she, she pointed to me that this is where the soldiers throw those, play the game on, uh, of, uh, of modern day probably dice to whoever wins will get the robe of Jesus. And I took that picture and I said, this is where they play to, to get the, the robe of Jesus as prophesied in the book of Psalms. Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. I took the picture and I was contemplating on Jesus walking towards his death for my sin and for your sin. This is just a view where we're almost to the holy, the holiest part of this um, of this uh, walk with me in the Lorosa. We're about to see the, the holy sepulchre. That's the holy sepulchre church. That's the holiest place for the Roman Catholic Church. Because in that church is where the tomb of Jesus was enshrined. And that's where the cross of Jesus, according to tradition, was in place. And so I decided to line up with people and every, you know, faithful pilgrim would, would touch the, the cross, the, the cross and then kiss some of their bows and then weave, and I also touch it. It's just like feeling a rock. It's like a rock. But the faithful were crying, and, and I can imagine I'm standing there, here I am, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventist minister, and I said, people felt their faith, and so I must feel my faith, because I know that Jesus was crucified there, but I need to feel the magnitude, and the, 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 the magnitude of the moment, because Jesus died for me. The church of the Holy Spirit, millions of visitors flock this place. This is just one of the, the interior that I took. There are a lot of pictures, but this is just one of the pictures. I did not show you intently the other pictures because it's full of icons and statues and, and uh, you know, when you enter a Roman Catholic church or an Orthodox church, you can uh, see like that. And I was going out, if you could see those two ladies with their, what do you see there? Those are uh, um, M16s. Those are Jewish. I'm now entering into the Jewish quarter. Most of them had their arms even on Sabbath. I was walking on Sabbath to take this picture. Because any time when, when there is a suicide bomber or something, the, the Israelites, right? Either the Israel or the Jewish people have to be ready. Friends, let us persevere. Jesus endured the cross for my sin and for your sin. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who, what everybody? The only reason why we persevere in our trials, the only reason why we persevere in the temptations that are coming to us, the only reason that we we'll persevere in the troubles that is in the present and that lies ahead is because we love Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 8, 8, all things.
always work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. The only reason why we need to persevere is because we love Him. And so I, I appreciate this church. I see that our faithful people are persevering to come to worship and to support the ministry here in this area. Brethren, let us persevere. Brethren, tonight, let us rejoice when we are facing trials. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is the trial, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you, might, you may be glad also with exceedingly, with exceeding joy. Are you facing trials in your life today? Are you going through that trial that tests your faith? Trials that that really put your fate into an acid test, like to encourage you to persevere, like to encourage you to rejoice. It was not easy to be a Christian. It is not easy to be a Christian. More so for us as pastors, it is not easy for us pastors. Why did I say that? Because I, most of the members are expecting a lot from their pastors, which is true, which is, which is important as well. And it's not easy because there is also the struggle, the trials that we are facing, that only by surrendering every weaknesses and trials to the Lord Jesus Christ can we overcome. And His Spirit will give us joy. The joy that I have as I pastor is seeing people accept the Lord Jesus Christ and becoming some of them as Christians through baptism. That is the joy the Lord gives in my heart. As I visit people, as they open up their, their hearts and they're telling their, their, their inmost soul and perfect trust to to, to their pastor and say, Pastor, I have a problem with my wife. I have a problem with my husband. I have a problem with my kids. Pastor, I have a problem in, in my work. Pastor, I have a problem with, with this sister and that sister and that brother. And, uh, you know, if I could only speak to them, I said, Wow. Thank God I experienced those things. Let us rejoice that we are all suffering because we love the Lord. Amen. Let us rejoice that we are partakers of Christ's suffering. Have you been, have you been whipped? Not yet, right? Have you been spit upon? Have you been put a, thorn, a crown of thorn on your head? Have you been tortured? Have you been ridiculed? Have you been scorned? Have you been derided? Have you been crucified? He endured, he persevered on the cross because he wanted to tell the world that he loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, this evening, God is calling us to be faithful. God is calling us to be prayerful. God is calling us to be purposeful. God is calling us to the truth, to be truthful. And tonight, the prayer point that I'd like to tell you is this. God is calling us to be humble and cheerful. Maybe the reason why you have trials is for God to fashion you to be just like Him. 
humble and teachable. I think that is what's happening to me as well. I'm being fashioned to be humble and teachable by those who care for me and those who love me. Why don't we accept those trials in our lives? Why don't we say, Lord, thank you for the trials? I remember the song says, Thank you, Lord, for the trials that come my way. In that way I can grow each day. I 